spent the last 25 years of my life working in many of the most challenging and difficult war zones in the world. But when I wake up every single morning, one of the thoughts that I have is that we are living in what is possibly the most extraordinary moment in all of human history for us to be alive. We have never had as much creativity, as much innovation and scientific and technological capacity and freedom as we do today. And at the same time, we've also never had as many fundamental and existential challenges and crisis as we face in our world today. And at the heart of all of this is us, human beings, and the choices that we make. 1,500 kilometers from where we are today, in Sevrodonetsk, there is fighting happening as we're speaking. More than 14 million people from Ukraine have been forced from their homes in the last three months. And today is the 101st day of the war. But war is not only happening in Ukraine. It's also happening in Syria, in Yemen, Mali, Afghanistan, Libya. In fact, war and armed violence are happening in far too many of our countries in the world today. And the impact that it is having on people's lives is devastating. The people killed, the millions upon millions who are injured, entire countries that are living through war and the impact that that has on people's lives, the visible and invisible effects that it has, including on children who are growing up and living in communities and countries that are torn apart by war. When I was preparing for today's talk, I was thinking of sharing with you pictures that I've taken over the last 25 years that show how war is affecting people in many different parts of our world. But I was thinking that many of those pictures were too powerful to share. But there are two that I do want to share with you to really bring forward what it is like to live through the horror and the terror of war. And one is this picture here and the look on this young boy's face. I remember the first time that I saw this picture, I was a fairly new father and my children were safe at home. And when I saw the look of absolute terror on this child's face and thought of the contrast for my own children playing without any fear or threat of violence, it brought home powerfully the reality and the effect that war has on people. And then another one is one of the most famous pictures that we have had in the world in our lifetime. And it is the terrible photo of the young Alan Kurdi as his body lay upon the beach when he had died as his parents tried to bring him out from a war zone and bring him to safety. But it's important when we see this picture of Alan that we also share the picture that his aunt in Canada has asked us to show. And that's a picture of Alan Kurdi when he was standing at the top of this slide on the playground and his face was filled with so much joy, so much pleasure, almost as if it was too much for his body to contain. And again, it made me think of my own children when I see them standing at the top of the playground, 
like children should be able to, not worrying, not fearing about any threat to their safety and well-being. And what strikes me every time I see this picture is that on this day when, when Alan was happy and safe, he was wearing his favorite clothes. And it's the very same outfit that his parents dressed him in when they took him on a journey that they hoped would bring him to a better life. Just a few weeks ago, we had a major report published in our field by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute on the environment of peace, looking at security in a new era of risk. And some of the things that it pointed out is that between 2010 and 2020, the number of state-based armed conflicts in the world roughly doubled to 56, as did the number of those people who are dying in armed conflict and war. The number of refugees and forcibly displaced people also doubled to 82.4 million. And in 2020, the number of operationally deployed nuclear warheads increased for the first time after years of reductions. And on another global crisis that we're facing, the environmental crisis, species are becoming extinct between 10 to 100 times faster than they would in the absence of human influence. And about 25% of the species on our Earth today are at the risk of extinction. The combined mass of wild mammals on Earth has shrunk to about one-sixth of its level before human civilization began. And in the last 45 years alone, the number of wild animals on our planet has fallen by nearly two-thirds. Even more alarming, insects, including pollinators, are in decline worldwide, with numbers in rainforest and many other localities falling by at least 75% in the last 40 years. It's been said that if all the insects in the world to go extinct, life on Earth would end within a few decades. It's also been said that if all people on Earth were to go extinct, life on Earth would begin to flourish again within a few years. What's noticeable about both the environmental crisis and war is that these are different than other types of disasters, like earthquakes and tsunamis, because these are disasters that we are actually choosing ourselves. These are disasters that we are investing in and training people in. Today, our world military budget, our, what we're spending on the military worldwide, is over 2 trillion, 113 billion dollars. This has been a near doubling of our military budget over the last 20 years. An even more shocking number than this is the amount of money that is hidden in tax havens around the world, which is estimated at somewhere between 21 to 32 trillion dollars. Now let's compare this with the most ambitious budgeting of the United Nations for what it would cost us if we chose to use our resources in this way to address all of what are called the Sustainable Development Goals. This means making sure that every woman in the world would be able to give birth safely in a hospital with proper medical care. It means that every child in the world would be able to grow up with the healthy nutrition and support that it needs. It would also mean that children and youth around the world would have education from kindergarten until university. And we would be tackling issues like poverty, soil erosion, and the greatest challenges that face us in our world today. And the cost 
that is given to meeting the sustainable development goals, the most ambitious budgeting, is five to seven trillion dollars a year. So the reality is that we have these resources. We have this capacity. But in our world today, we are choosing to use these resources not to invest in the solutions that can help us to create a better world for all of us, but in the very systems and processes that are threatening our existence. And it reminds me always of this quote by the former president and commander-in-chief in the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, when he says that every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. The world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Is there no other way the world may live. But when we speak about conflicts and war, it's not only what's happening in, in Ukraine, in Yemen, in Syria, and other countries around the world. Conflicts are also part of our lives every single day. Can I ask, is there anyone in this room, or how many of us in this room have brothers and sisters? Anybody, if you have a show of hands? All right. And how many are in or have been in a relationship uh, with a partner, a husband, a wife, a spouse, somebody that you love? Anyone here have children? All right, last question like this. How many of us here have had or have parents? Okay, so it's probably a safe bet to say that every one of us in this room has experienced conflicts. Because conflicts are normal. It doesn't matter what your age, your generation, your background, where you come from in this world. All of us have conflicts. The thing that people working in peace building bring forward is that conflicts and violence are not the same thing. Conflicts can be normal. We all have them. It doesn't mean that we always deal with them well. And that's the key part. What matters is how do we deal with conflicts. And the extraordinary thing that we've discovered over years and decades working in peace building is that we can actually improve our ability to address conflicts effectively healthily, and to prevent violence. We can learn in school and in life creative problem solving. We can learn tricks and techniques and skills that can help us to breathe, to de-escalate when we're feeling tense, when we're reacting in a negative way. And we can train in life and in school through peace education to develop the skills to address conflicts effectively. Because what matters isn't just whether we face a problem or a challenge in life or a crisis in our world. What matters is how we choose to address it. And this is important because we're facing a lot of challenges and crisis in our world today. From organized environmental destruction to loss of trust between us as people, the failures in our governance to deal with many of the challenges we face, growing economic inequalities, and war. And the thing about these challenges is they're complex. 
they're not easy to solve or to deal with. They're, they're multidimensional and multi-causal. They're dynamic. They don't just sit there waiting for you to solve them. And they're interconnected. They reinforce and support each other. So, for example, the very resources that we're using, investing in war to bring about organized death and destruction, could be invested in helping to solve the challenges we face, like climate destruction. And they're also self-reinforcing. It's really difficult to work to change them. So at this point, when we think about all these crises and challenges we face in the world, one of the questions that I often ask is, are you filled with this deep sense of confidence and knowledge that our governments in the world today are bringing the best of our capacity as a species to solve them. When we think about the people that we're putting in elected office and the heads of state that we have around the world today, do we see that we're really using, harnessing our creativity, our innovation, our capability as a species to solve problems. Now, sometimes when we look at these problems and when we look at these people in power, it can almost seem overwhelming. And one of the things that we often experience when we have conflicts, whether it's in our own lives or if we're looking at what's happening in the situation in Ukraine today, it can make us feel powerless almost as if there's this leviathan, this, this giant that is too big for us to tackle. But part of what inspires me by what we see happening also in Ukraine today is that while on the one hand you have this top-down, destructive, bankrupt, outdated way of dealing with conflicts, this war and invasion and attempt to occupy another people and country, on the other side, you have this incredible response. We saw it here in Cluj, we've seen it around the world of people standing up and doing everything they can to help. And I love this picture of Yulia, who's one of the most extraordinary people that I've met on my trips into Ukraine over the last weeks, who's been involved right from the beginning in helping to mobilize. And when I spoke with Yulia the first time, she told me, when the war began for the first two weeks, I dressed in black every day because that was how I felt. But then one morning I woke up and I realized, and this is where I have to edit what I'm about to say because it's a TED talk. I won't use the exact word she did, but she said, I'm not going to allow some dot, dot, dot man in the Kremlin tell me how to dress. I'm not going to allow him to decide how I'm going to live my life. And then she chose to dress again in colors, and she chose to bring her life, her passion, to be the change that she wants to see in the world today. This year, 2022, is the 50th anniversary of the 1972 United Nations Conference on Human Environment in Stockholm. This was the first major global effort to bring countries together from around the world to collaborate in solving a crisis that threatens us all. And today we are living in the largest mobilization, the largest social movement in the history of our species. As people of every background around the world are standing up and saying enough to all of the different challenges and problems that are facing us from continual destruction of the environment to sexism, patriarchy, gender-based violence and abuse, inequality, exclusion, poverty, corruption, and bad governance. And we're seeing new faces of leadership emerge. Faces that recognize the need for collaboration. 
for listening, even when we have differences and may not agree with each other, to try and find solutions together. And when we look back at our human history, one of the things that we see is that whenever we have faced insurmountable odds and problems, which we thought perhaps it's too big to change, we've stood up. From the Berlin Wall to the civil rights movement in the United States, the citizens' peace movement in Northern Ireland, the end of apartheid in South Africa, the ongoing struggle for women's rights, and the LGBTQI plus liberation and rights movements. So what I would like to end with is this. A picture of my boys, Carl and Aaron. And to ask every one of us here today, when you think about 10, 15, 20 years from now, and you look back on your life, or if you have children today or will in the future, and they ask you, when our world was faced with these challenges, what did you do? I want to be able to look to Carl and Aaron and to tell them, I chose to act because it's up to every one of us together to be the change we wish to see in our world. Thank you.